pressure looks good. Tallin up. Water towers can fly! They go down phenomenal. Five down by a feed off. Bring it, that's the heat off. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, five by five check. Make sure audio is okay. Wait to see that from chat. There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to NASA Space Flight Live. It's the show where we talk about the week's news and events in the space industry. I'm very happy to have you here today. Um, I'm your host, Matt Anderson. Joining me are NASA Space Flight reporter Adrian Bile. Hello. Hello, everyone. Two weeks in a row. Glad to be here. And NASA Space Flight's assistant managing editor, Chris Gebhardt. Thank you very much for being here. Always a pleasure. Happy to talk about what happened this week. Uh, just a reminder to chat, we are able to take your questions throughout the show. You can use at Nessa Space Flight in the chat in order to tag us for a question, and we'll try to get that answered for you. Also, your uh, super chats go in the question queue as well as priority questions. Um, today, we're talking about Falcon Heavy updates, Inspiration 4, Starship, uh, some international launch news, and some updates on the James Webb uh, Telescope. Uh, you want to start off with the uh, Falcon Heavy? Well, it's been quite a it's been quite a week uh, <laughs> for news, uh, definitely uh, in the SpaceX realm. But Falcon Heavy, with a, <clears throat> I, I don't know how you feel about this, Adrian, but this was this was kind of a surprise win uh, for SpaceX on the in the launch contract world. Uh, Falcon Heavy won the contract to launch the GOES-U satellite, so that's the Geostationary Operational Environmental Weather Satellite. So basically. If you watch the news anywhere in North, South America, and you've seen an image from a satellite of what it looks like over your place, this is from one of these ghost weather satellites. And what is amazing about this is that Falcon Heavy and SpaceX won the launch contract for it at $152.5 million, marking the first time in history that an Atlas or a Delta rocket has not launched one oh. of these ghost weather satellites. And that is incredible. Um, now, of course, a couple of reasons for this, right? The Delta line has already been discontinued, so there wasn't a possibility for the Delta to launch it. Um, but whether or not ULA would have bid the Atlas or the Vulcan for it is kind of interesting, right? We know that ULA took the Atlas out of the commercial sales world a few weeks ago, uh, but the contracts for this one would have predated that. So it's possible they could have bid an Atlas. It's possible they could have bid the Vulcan, which is sort of combining the Atlas and Delta lines together. So if Vulcan would have won this, it wouldn't have been quite as shocking, uh, I, I think, in terms of contract world. Um, but really, really demonstrates this because this goes you satellite launching in April of 2024 will follow the goes T satellite, which is launching in January, this coming January on an Atlas V rocket. And Falcon Heavy's price tag for this is about $13.2 million cheaper than that Atlas V coming up here in January. So it's it's impressive. It's a good savings for NASA, but it's also really, really important in terms of this system and what it means for you know SpaceX continuing to disrupt what has sort of always been the status quo of things. What do you think, Adrian? Yeah, if there's one mission line that I always thought would be locked in ULA and would uh, probably one of the first uh, big missions on, on uh, Vulcan that would be assigned next, I would have thought it would be this. Um, when this was announced for Falcon Heavy, and especially at this price tag, I thought that's a statement for SpaceX and for Falcon Heavy. And if you're at ULA, you probably at least are a bit worried that this contract is not under lock for you in the future. And you know that you have to compete against the launch provider that you in the previous, uh, previously with Clipper lost uh, as well, uh, in terms of price especially. So for, the, for ULA, who try to be more cost competitive with Vulcan, this is something to watch out for, and uh, they really need to find ways to outbid Falcon Heavy in these uh, in these uh, kind of missions they are constantly losing right now. 
Yeah, and and I know we've got some pictures too, Matt. If we want to, if we want to kind of go yes, through please. those of yeah, of some of the heavy stuff here, because you know, aging. What you were just saying to the contracts is very interesting, right? And it's worth noting that while that until the source selection document comes out, right? Um, uh, it's 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 we we can't say for certain whether or not ULA build the, bid bid an atlas or bid a Vulcan, um, but. One thing that is kind of interesting is if they bid the Vulcan right there, there are a couple of things that could have come into play here, right, for why the Vulcan might not have gotten it. One might have been price, certainly. Um, the other might have been that, you know, it takes a while for rockets to be certified to launch specific classes of satellites. And especially when they're on the higher end of the priority list, which the GOES weather satellites are, because they are critical to weather forecasting in, in real time. Um, Sometimes rockets need to fly X number of successful missions before they can be certified for these particular missions. Like, like the Falcon Heavy, for example, didn't originally have the classification and certification rating from NASA and the US government that would have been necessary to launch a GOES weather satellite. It had to prove that it could do that, right? And that it was, re uh, that it was reliable enough. So it might be something about Vulcan's nascent nature that, that got in here. It might be a price point it might have something to do with the fact that Vulcan hasn't flown yet. And we've already seen the US Space Force start to get a little bit nervous about what to do with assigning national security missions to Vulcan, given the delays that are ongoing with, with the delivery of the BE-4 engines for that one. So in all fairness to ULA, there might have been some mitigating factors here that tipped it really heavily in Falcon Heavy's favor as the only other vehicle that could do it. Um, because New Glenn also, I mean, who knows if Blue Origin bid New Glenn, but New Glenn would be in the same position that Vulcan would be in and that it hasn't flown yet, so it hasn't proven that it can handle some of these higher sensitive nature missions. But generally yeah, an issue of confidence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's like we it's like, you know, like there's there's no reason to believe that large scale rocket systems will will have large scale failures, right? But the earlier are the earlier are the earlier on you are, ooh, that was a tongue twister. Uh the earlier <laughs> on you are in a program, the more reserved NASA and the government is going to be until you prove to them that the technology can do what you say it can do. Also, it wouldn't be the first time that we see uh, a rocket having issues early in its in its lifetime. So um, if if I'm in the position of the ULA right now, I would really love to uh, fly Vulcan so I can show potential uh, mm -hmm. potential contract uh, contractors that I that this rocket is ready and that uh, it can fly payloads. And it, I'm I'm pretty sure that at least some concern is about that. It's it never flew so far. So and Falcon Heavy flew three times. So you have one rocket that flew three times. You have one that is still ish ha still having some issues getting to the first flight. And um, that's that's just what would you pick? Mm -hmm. And and to be totally fair, the the exact opposite was true back in 2015 and 2016 and 2017 when Falcon Heavy was being developed and was was sort of you know always a consistent six months away there for a while in in those years. Um, but there were a lot of people back then that was said, I don't understand why Falcon Heavy can't win some of these launch contracts. It hadn't flown yet. That's why it couldn't win them, right? But once you can start showing that you're flying, you can start getting a lot more missions. Now, that's not to say that you don't have missions when you first offer a rocket, right? Like the Vulcan has upwards of 25 to 30 missions or more already, according to Tori, like that that have been purchased, right? What what we tend to see is these more high profile importance missions that come down to like the battle of the heavyweights in, in who gets to launch them. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Chris, but some of these uh, these um, shows the selection statements that are coming out. Uh, sometimes they mention that uh, they, if they have confidence in the rocket um, completing mm -hmm. X flights before this mission is coming up, mm -hmm. and uh, it often is a goal or um, uh, a requirement for this uh, certain payload before it mm -hmm. can fly, and confidence in these pre-flights has to be there. Yeah, no, and that, that, that's an excellent point too that, that you bring up, Adrian. It's, it's not that rockets can't bid for missions that they're not currently certified to fly, right? right. Com 
companies can certainly put forward rockets if they think the flight rate will, by the time that mission gets there, the rocket will have gained the certification that's necessary. And we have seen NASA and, and the government do that sometimes, right? Where, where they will give a launch contract to a rocket going, yeah, it hasn't flown this many times, but given the manifest that it has, it's going to by the time we get there. And we're, we're confident we'll be able to complete the review in time. So that's also a, a good point too. So as time goes on, I mean, Falcon Heavy is only going to get more launches under its belt. Did that become a bigger hurdle to anybody who's later coming to the game, trying to get more contracts? <laughs> Uh, it can, it, it can in, in many ways, because there's, there's at first going to be the, the, you know, the, well, this company is tried and true, right? We know their history. We know the record. We know the reliability of the rockets that they fly, right? Like, like one thing that ULA really does have in its favor, even though the price point is a bit higher, they've never lost a mission to their credit. They've had issues during launches, but they've never lost a mission. That's a huge bonus to them. Um, whereas SpaceX's ability to sort of, hey, like if you need a Falcon Heavy within four months, as long as we've got a center core lying around, we might be able to help you out, right, in terms of pricing. Yeah. But, you know, we haven't, but, but we saw, right, it took Falcon Heavy a while to start getting contract after contract after contract after contract under its belt. Um, it really did have some of those early rocket teething pains. And a lot of that did have to do with the fact that a bunch of the other rockets that were sort of in its class, although it's the it's the most powerful rocket currently flying in the world right now, but even the rockets very similar to its class, had more of that history that people could get behind and say, yeah, that might be it might be a bit more, but I know the reliability record of that one. So yeah, it can it can be a challenge for new entrants, definitely. This is like job, job applications where you. Uh, can't get hired until you have experience. You can't get experience until you get hired. <laughs> In yeah, some ways, yes. <laughs> uh, we did a, a, a question here from Everyday Space Nerd. Uh, could yeah. they launch a Dragon XL on Falcon Heavy to the Lunar Gateway? Uh, well, that's the plan, actually. So, so the Dragon XL is the um, is the proposed car. Well, the proposed and approved sort of from NASA funding standpoint but funding's a bit wonky right now because congress yay um <laughs> and everything but dragon xl is the sort of the cargo variant successor to the dragons that did the cargo runs to the international space station before the current ones where it's an uncrewed vehicle it's bigger it can service gateway in the ways that gateway actually needs it but the plan is to launch it on a falcon heavy yes it's awesome more well, falcon heavy missions you yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, is it true? This is a, another question here uh, from the Phantom Rocket. Is it true that SpaceX is now going to human certify Falcon Heavy? I have not heard anything about that. There was a fleeting sort of reference several years ago to a to a Mars 2020 flight called Red Dragon, which obviously did not happen, um, where a, an uncrewed but crew-capable Dragon would have been sent to the surface of Mars. And that would have launched on a heavy under the proposals. But Elon has not really talked about a need to human rate the Falcon Heavy um, because the, the LEO sort of destinations that these capsules are designed for are suited for the Falcon, are suited for the Falcon 9. If we're talking about beyond low Earth orbit transportation for SpaceX, we'd be looking at Starship at that point. Got it. And then a quick super chat from Jim Cavett, who just said, thanks, guys. I can see SpaceX is the one to follow. Thanks for your support, Jim. Yeah. And it's it's worth noting, too, right, Adrian? Like, I mean, because it, because it's it's the GOSU contract that sort of got us talking about the Falcon Heavy, but they just won the Europa Clipper contract as well, yes. which was the worst kept secret in our industry. <laughs> um, <laughs> that that Falcon Heavy had that contract, um, although it was competitive, like it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that the Heavy would get it. Um, but it, it got that one. It got the first two elements of the Lunar Gateway, the PPE and the Halo module, the habitation module, which is as of right now, the first confirmed flight of the new larger stretched payload fairing uh, for the Falcons um, uh, and specifically the Falcon Heavy. So, you know, but, but the Heavy has really been ticking off a lot of contract wins this year, which is nice to see. Yeah, especially these really... 
I would I wouldn't say flagship, but really expensive, really really uh, high level payloads. It's not just uh, like, for example right shares or something. It's it's really high level payloads that you would normally maybe expect on previously you would totally expect these on an Atlas or or a Delta. Like that would be yeah. these launches are all launches where you would be like yeah that's a ULA launch. Yeah, and, and flagship is the is the exact right way to phrase that, especially for the Europa Clipper mission, which is, you know, one of NASA's gigantic flagship missions. The the sort of in NASA jargon, that's that's their way of saying it doesn't have a crew on it, but it's the most important that it could possibly be without having a crew on it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, these scenes that we're seeing right now are from the first Falcon Heavy uh, launch, its demo flight back in February of 2018. But uh, Adrian, I'm really excited because we're going to get to see this again really soon. And it's been a while since we've, since we've seen a Heavy. For all we've talked about the contracts they've been winning, there's been a launch drought for a couple of years here. Yeah, I, I, I remember this moment when people started talking about, oh my god, when does Heavy fly ever again? And it's soon. Like it's in uh, October nine, I think, is mm -hmm. the next launch for Falcon Heavy. We recently saw the center core in a picture that SpaceX posted uh, related to the Inspiration Four mission. But everyone below the tweet was not really talking about the uh, Inspiration Four capsule in the foreground, but the uh, Falcon Heavy center core, which uh, <laughs> the first the first thing the I saw when I saw the photograph. It's the first thing my yeah. eye landed on was ooh a white inner stage Falcon Heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely the same year. I, I saw it and was like, yeah, heavy. Um, and it will launch the USS F-44 mission for the US Space Force. Um, and it will expand the center core. It will be a double drone ship recovery on, of course, I s no, on, on re just read the instructions and a shortfall of Gravitas. Uh, and the center core will go take a bath. That's going to be yes, fun to it see. Will. It will. It will. I hope. I hope they have the drone ships like positioned in a way. Like we've seen this a couple of times with um, when Starlink missions were were going to overlap with one another, and the drone ships were like a, like half a mile away from one another, uh, but they could see each other in their cameras. And I'm really, really hoping that the drone ship cameras are angled in a way where like you know a shortfall of gravitas can see not only its booster coming down but the booster coming down on just to read the instructions in the distance like i really hope there's that or that they've got a drone in the air that can broadcast live as those they've got to in. yeah they, they've got a good degree of showmanship for the things that they do so uh i imagine that they'll have something along those lines They've got to. They've got to. But do we know how far the drone ship will be apart when the? I mean, the side boosters were really close for in in previous missions, obviously, since they landed together on yeah. on the landing zones. But do we expect these to be close to each other when they land? I so I, I kind of do, actually, for, for the exact reason of, like, they've already shown that they can do it. And if you can get the drone ships in and about the same location, it can make it easier for the, um, uh, it can make it easier if your support crews would need to go back and forth. Each drone ship typically has its own support crew, of course, but, like, if, they're, if they needed to trade off, if they needed to swap things around, like, having them close together, I, I, I could see the ad advantages to that. And if there's yeah. no real technical reason to separate them, then then why necessarily separate them as long as they can, you know, because they're not going to be aiming for the drone ships like they don't do that until the landing burns begin. Yeah. So, you know, they, they would know where the ditch locations for each of them would be in the event of an engine failure during the landing burn. So I don't know, I, I, I really don't see a reason why they would need to separate them like that. They could get them pretty close together then. They they could. They could probably get them literally as close as the radio frequencies would allow. Like for the for the, for the individual boosters to lock mm -hmm. onto their drone ships. Like there that's that might if that's even a limiting factor, that might be it for how close they could be together. You know, and drift in the will ocean be a drone shot like that. of that. I'm one hundred percent sure. Yeah. Uh knowing SpaceX, knowing Elon that there will be a wide drone shot of both drone ships and the boosters landing on them 100%. Yep. And I will enjoy it. Yes, did, exactly. Did radio come into play at all <laughs> during the uh, the pad um, landings? 
Uh, so they, they do have GPS coordinates that they lock into at first. And then my understanding is that they, they, they do acquire signal from their landing locations so that they can zero in on or, or have that added, like, here I am, here I am, here I am as they're, as they're coming down. Um, for the land landings, it might just be a, a matter of plugging in the coordinates, but there's probably still radar and guidance systems to help them as they come on in. Because because yeah. the the boosters themselves have radars as well as part of their landing systems and everything, so that was part of the whole question when with, uh, for the footage that we're seeing right now of of the very first time they did this, I think it was up until twenty four hours before launch the boot they were actually going to stagger the boosters so one would land and then like thirty seconds later the other one would come down and then like at the very last minute when they were really looking at the radio frequency interference between the two of them they went nah it, Elon went nah it's probably fine just do it synchronize them you can bring them down together and that's how they've done it every time since so we've got a few more uh, chat questions about falcon heavy yeah. if you're ready to take them of course um alex alex fisher asks uh what payload mass allows for a falcon heavy booster rtls are any of the contracts it has now planned to rtls and what is rtls yes <laughs> Um, so RTLS stands for return to launch site, and it refers to the landing profile that the boosters do. So RTLS, return to, land, land, return to launch site, just means they come back to Cape Canaveral or to Vandenberg Space Force Base um, after liftoff to land. Uh, otherwise, we would call it a drone ship landing out at, out at sea. So, so that's that. And, and yeah, so there, there's both a payload mass and a where is your payload going consideration for the Falcon Heavies in terms of when the side cores, uh, the side boosters can come back and perform those land landings. Um, so for this particular mission that we're talking about that's upcoming, USSF 44 on October 9th. So that is one that is that is inserting um, a classified payload for the US government, so we don't know what the mass is, we don't know anything like that, um, but we can infer a couple of things. One, it's either going to geostationary orbit and it's going directly there, which would mean you'd have to leave a lot more propellant in your second stage, which is why you would burn the boosters for longer so that that propellant reserve in the second stage is maintained for your direct burns into geo. It could indicate a really, 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 really massive satellite that's going to geostationary transfer orbit that is just that has so much mass that that's that the side cores just have to burn that long and precludes them coming back um but those are really the only two things that we can infer from it based on the classified nature of the mission um including that there's only one payload that's actually known right now on it and it's the uh adrian we were looking this up earlier right and having a yes. laugh over how they phrased it uh it's tetra one and do you remember how they phrased it I think it's like uh, space operations. Uh, I'm not even Procedures sure. Procedures like... and strategies in and around yeah. geosynchronous orbit. It's like the vaguest way the government can say none of your business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it's basically saying don't ask, really. Yeah. Don't, don't ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Got it. Um, yeah. We'll get a, a couple more of these in here. Uh, did you have anything else to add onto that one? Uh, no, no, the, uh, okay. the, to, to that no. one, the, it, it literally does come down to mass and where they're going considerations. Uh, Human asks, when do you think Falcon Heavy gets its extended fairing? Good question. Um, <laughs> we know that there is uh, the confirmed mission that Chris mentioned uh, a bit earlier, which is the uh, gateway, which will use the uh, extended fairing. But we also know that uh, Space Force, I think the, the Space Force required um, the extended fairing for some of the missions they just assigned to Falcon Heavy. So there will be some missions in there that use the extended fairing. But we, due to the classified nature of these missions, we don't really know yet which, when, and yeah, it, it, somewhere they will use it for sure. All right. Yeah, we don't know the who, what, when, where, why, but we can guarantee you it's coming. <laughs> then there's a rendering of it. Yeah. Why is Falcon Heavy? <laughs> yes. Uh, re re real quirk from uh, from Remy Turk. Uh, Twenty pounds. Watching the stream again from the couch together with my wife. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Remy. 
And um, let's see, just a quick comment from uh, TMP Railroad. Uh, this is weird. Uh, is there any way I can see the launch from the cruise port? My boat sails the day of the heavy. Uh, yes, so that would all come down for to timing, really. Um, if but but yeah, um, if your cruise is going out of uh, uh, if your cruise is going out of Port Canaveral on October 9th and heavy sticks to that date. Yeah, you'd be able to see it from the port or, or out at sea, definitely. Where are you going? Take me with you. Yes, I want to go. <laughs> uh, Paul Kelly asks, how many uh, heavy core center cores are set to be expended on the currently known launches? Um, under the currently known ones, Adrian, I believe it's just USSF-44, right? Um, no, for the ones where they intend... Oh, well, Clipper, Clipper will extend the center core? Yeah, Clipper will expand everything, right? But technically, that's also the center core. Yeah, is, isn't isn't Clipper that that's true? That's true. The Clipper is one of those ones where we're pretty sure it's fully expendable, yeah. but like no one's actually said it yet or like confirmed. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Also, so I'm two. not sure about uh, there's <laughs> another uh, space force mission next year, right? When is is that recovered? I'm oh, that's sure. USS. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a recovery one, where the okay. where the at least the side cores will come back to RTLS. Um, so yeah, we're two the, confirmed the, basically. Yeah, the the, the, the other thing. I, yeah, and I think the other thing, right, Adrian, that that kind of makes this interesting is we've all the other times we've seen SpaceX attempt to recover the core, it has it has not gone to plan. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, we'll see. I, I know Gwen was like, if we have to build a new center core every time, we will. <laughs> um, but but I know they'll probably want to get those back. But yeah, so two or three, maybe. Okay. Uh, we've got probably a, a couple more minutes here that we can give to Falcon Heavy before we move on. Um, and there are there's no lack of questions in the chat. Uh, a related one to the last uh, from J Trains. Are the Falcon Heavy um, mission? Sorry. I'm trying to parse this a little bit. The next Falcon Heavy missions, are the boosters new or used? Uh, they mm -hmm. are new on USSF-44. Yes. Which okay. does raise, which does actually raise a good question. Where are those other side cores from the ArabSat 6A and the STP-2 mission? Because STP-2 reused the side cores from the ArabSat 6A flight a few months prior to it. And then those cores have literally just been sitting there. And that's been one of the interesting things of watching the manifest is Elon had previously said that Falcon heavy side cores just need an interstage and they can become Falcon nines. But when we saw them losing Falcon nines in the manifest to landing failures um, over the last two years, they never brought those side cores over and converted them and they're not being used for this USSF mission. Um, that Now that could be because this particular mission from the US Space Force asked for all new cores um and so that's what they're getting also possible there's some reason they don't want to refly the other ones from the previous from the previous heavy but it's interesting Could also be like, like there is an interesting idea i think that maybe uh, spacex is just right now using the customers that want new cores and get new cores all the time like new site boosters and if they can convert them easily they basically get uh, a paid fleet of pro possible Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy side cores um, just by that and just have a new fleet for your stalling, whatever. And uh, that the, the, the customers pay for it since they are competitive in the market, even with, for example, expendable uh, center cores. Yeah, good point. Well, let's see here. From Konstantin Alexandrov uh, at NASA Space Flight, is Atlas V more powerful than Falcon 9, and why Falcon Heavy, not F9? Uh, Atlas V is not more powerful than Falcon 9. Uh, than, wait, sorry. Atlas V is more powerful than... Fa oh, Falcon 9. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, yes, um, configurations of the Atlas V can be more powerful than the, than the Falcon 9. Um, this is one of those ones where it's it's hard to do a direct comparison because the Atlas has so many different variants to it where 
you know, like an, an, an Atlas V in a 401 configuration, meaning four meter payload fairings, single end, no solid rocket motors, and a single engine Centaur upper stage is less powerful than a Falcon 9 at liftoff, but has a fairly comparable payload to orbit mass because of the efficiency of the second uh, of the second stage engine on the centaur but then when you start getting into like the atlas fives where they have five solid rocket motors and dual engine centaur upper stages though though those are above the falcon 9 in terms of capacity but not above the falcon heavy in terms of capacity so heavy falcon heavy wins over the atlas 5 but it depends on the specific atlas 5 configuration as to whether or not it wins over the falcon 9 if that makes sense Oh, that's a good explanation. Uh, I think we have probably one more question before we move on to oh, Inspiration oh. 4. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. What, one thing. I realize what the second part of that question is. Why Falcon Heavy and not Falcon 9? This goes back to the GOES-U satellite. Um, Falcon 9 cannot get the GOES-U satellite directly into geostationary orbit, but the Falcon Heavy can. And that's why it's a Falcon Heavy and not a Falcon 9. Okay. All right. Let me see here. We had, we had no, a, a few people asking here <laughs> real quick. Uh, uh, Olivier and uh, Janus in chat both were uh, were asking, uh, is there any news about SN20? Oh, oh, Starship 20. Um, we'll yes, get uh, to that later. We'll get to I, that. I later. know it was yes, it was an Starship, abrupt transition, yes. but <laughs> um, wanna, we, uh, we we, we in, just have going short, over and over again. <laughs> yeah, in short order. No. Uh, short answer, no. But we'll get to that in much more detail in about 30 minutes. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> um, for now, I think it's probably about time that we move on to all these other interesting topics that we have right now. We've been uh, pretty focused on Falcon Heavy for the last three minutes. Uh, Inspiration 4. Let's get started yes. with that. Adrian, you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, we have a launch window now starting on September 15, starting at 8.01 p.m., uh, and I, I think it goes 24 hours and how many? 30? 23 minutes or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Something weird. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a daily launch window that's just more than 24 hours in duration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was a bit confused when you told me that. And uh, yeah. However, they will um, make the launch window smaller at L minus three days and uh, shrink it down to four hour, uh, five hours. So um, we probably will get a better picture when Inspiration will launch tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. And uh, that will help, uh, especially void Europeans, uh, to schedule planning because I fear that it might not go at a time where I can watch it. What, you mean you don't want to be up at four o'clock in the morning your time watching Inspiration 4 leave the pad? <laughs> That would be fine. I have no issues with that. But if, if I have to work at that time, that would be not good. <laughs> well, that too. That too. Um, yeah, because this is really weird. And yeah, like 8 p.m. Eastern on uh, on Wednesday, September 15th, which is just after midnight. It's one minute after midnight on September 16th UTC. So uh, this would be the 16th in Europe. Um uh, yeah, for 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 a lot of folks, if it if it goes at that opening of the window, yeah, it's it's interesting because it, because they're not trying to rendezvous with anything, right? This is a weird mission where they're 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 balancing the weather because it's still summertime pattern in Florida, so you've got to watch out for those like late afternoon, early evening launch times because thunderstorms. I, as I look out my window and there's a billowing thunderstorm headed my way, like you know, um, you you do have to watch out for those this time of year still. But there's also the interesting element of trying to time it when the most number of people would be able to watch, because that's part of the big thing of this mission, right, is raising awareness for um, uh, for St. Jude Children's Hospital, raising money for, for pediatric cancer research. So you don't necessarily want to go at midnight because you're not trying to rendezvous with anything. What does that do for you if you're trying to get people to watch it. So that's why I think this like 8.01 PM is the opening of the launch window. Well, that's perfect in the US because that means that all of your 7 PM newscasts and Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy are over and news agencies have one minute to begin a broadcast and, and then kick it over to the launch, right? I mean, 8.01 PM for something that's not rendezvousing seems ridiculous until you start breaking it down in terms of broadcast. And that's very different. Right. And, and 
a fascinating element to this flight's yeah. launch time. Is this the is this the first time that broadcasting is like an issue for planning a launch mission? Was that ever an issue before in a or not not an issue but a consideration in in a I'm, launch mission? I'm sure it's played into things before. Yeah, I'm sure it's played into things. Um, usually when, when you have missions that don't have specific launch date times that they need to target, you, you actually try to go as early in the day as possible so that you have as much time during the day with your teams, yeah. right? Without having to sleep shift them into these weird times where like they're waking up at noon to come in at two, right? And that's not normal rhythms and, and things like that. Um, but but yeah, off the top of my head, I, I, I really don't think so because because otherwise you're trying to get to geostationary orbit, which gives you a launch time. You're trying to get over a certain part of the planet at a certain, you know, at, at a certain lighting condition angle, which dictates a launch time. You're trying to rendezvous with something which really dictates your launch time. You know, yeah, it's 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 never really been a big one before. No. Um St. Jude as well is such an incredible yeah. charity. I just I just wanted oh. to mention that real quick. I had a chance to get over there to the to the hospital um, for the St. Jude Summit, part of the whole gaming thing, because um, we do a fundraiser yeah. for St. Jude Live every year, and and they do such incredible work, um, providing care for uh, families who otherwise might not be able to afford it, providing uh, places for for parents to stay while their kids are, are going under uh, various treatments for different diseases. Um, just really, really an amazing place. So I'm excited for inspiration. I, I am too. And, and, you know, for everything that you just said about St. Jude as well, they, they, they are an amazing pediatric cancer research um, institution as well. And for, for, for anyone who hasn't had the time yet, um, the first two episodes of the Netflix documentary series on Inspiration4 is out. Um, and the first one overviews the four crew members. And, and if you have not had a chance to watch um... those yet, I... I really recommend you do because Haley's story is Haley's story think... will bring it will bring tears to you, um, and and will really sort of encapsulate what the mission is for and and what it's really trying to do, and and I think in very important ways too how it is different and how it is set apart from the Virgin Galactic, uh, for the, the Virgin Galactic and the um, Blue Origin suborbital tourism flights that we saw earlier this summer. I think Michael is telling us uh, that we need to restart the conferencing software and uh, we will cut audio for the moment. Okay. So, uh, ah, yes. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. Continue. All right, quick five by All five, right. just to check audio levels now that we're we've done a little reset on things. Check. Hello, hello. Hopefully that all works. No oh. sound. Five by five. No, we're getting five by fives now. Okay. All right. Are we we're still bad is what we're getting. All right. We. I'm thinking it may be in in. Uh, one, one second. Hold on, guys. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't pop. Please don't pop. All right, let's see. 
We still getting pops? Okay. I don't know where else it could be if it's not in, in this software and it's under the microphones because we're fine. Yeah, we're looking into it. It isn't on the microphone ends, because we can all hear each other just fine with no popping. It's something about how it's getting pushed to YouTube. Uh, so we just yeah. have to identify what that is. And resume. How does that sound now, chat? All right, would you go ahead and talk a little bit, just to see if it's yeah. just me now? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so 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 yeah. So as as we were saying, there, there's a little bit of an interesting thing with this because of the consideration of timing for um, audience viewership figures and having everything um, really and and being able to really tell the story of Saint Jude. That's that's what we were talking about right before that audio issue happened. And how am I sounding, Chat? Um, not sure if I'm sounding good or not. I need to know if I'm still popping too now. Like you're fixed. Would it suddenly fix everything? <laughs> do you do you hear me popping? I don't hear you popping. Okay. No. Um, Am I fine? Validation. <laughs> you're fine with me, Adrian. Um, but but yes, we 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 were, we were talking about what what sets this mission apart, right? And we were talking about um, we're talking about Saint Jude Children's Hospital and the cancer research that that goes on there, and, and everything that Saint Jude does. And, and to me, this is one of these really important moments of what sets inspiration for apart from the more tr the more tourism driven Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin flights earlier this summer. Um, is, is the dedication to science and research and raising money for for this particular cause. That's a huge difference to me in how we use orbital versus suborbital private flights. And I feel like only with these kinds of flights, you have a chance to inspirate the public, like um, not to be um, offensive to anyone, but a billionaire going to space is something different than a charity fundraiser that um, basically puts that goal up front. The other flights also had charity f stuff going on, but the problem is um, if, if, if it's not really in the foreground, the the public will not always look at that. They will look at other things. And this one is really, this is our main, this is the thing we are talking about. And this helps to to get that out to the public and excite people for it. It, it, it really does. It, it's going to be, it's going to be so interesting for me and, and I'm sure for many, many others to be there on, on Wednesday for, for the launch, if, if Wednesday is the launch date for this, because seeing, seeing crew leave from 39a but it's not a nasa mission like like watching people launch from u.s soil and it's not a nasa flight is in some ways going to be bizarre yet because we've seen the falcons launch before with with crew on board it's going to seem somewhat familiar and and i i kind of like that that's the the era that we're in right now that that nasa can be a spectator but there's still something that like gives you that like connection to the past and, and in a lot of ways you know like a lot of people i think are making a big deal rightfully so about nasa's kind of a spectator for inspiration for but like when you talk to nasa that was the goal of the commercial crew program that nasa would become one of many um that would utilize the services and it's phenomenal that to me that inspiration for is the first and i look forward to all the axiom missions that are coming up as well on 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 the dragons and the falcon nines uh that'll actually go to the space station as well but man what an era um just 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 yeah. what an era and and two to think how many people have gone to space this year like not just on the falcons and the soyuzes but China has been launching. China's second crew flight is coming up here in about a month um, for this year. I mean, the sheer number of people who will have gone to space this year is 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 amazing. And I can't wait for that number to keep going up each year. I think we're just missing a record now because it's going one day later, right? So the Chinese will be on ground. There was something about it might be able to set a record on most people in space at the same time. But it, it, I think that... That's missed. Well, 
I, I think you wouldn't have gotten there either because you would have had to have included the Virgin Galactic Cruise um, in that because they did cross the boundary. Um, and there were there was Branson, Sarisha, Beth, Colin, and the two pi there were six on that one. So with the seven on the ISS, the three on the Chinese station, and the six on Virgin Galactic, that's when we set the record. So IR4 would not have set the record for number in space, but would have set the record for number in orbit. And um, we'll have to see how the Chinese missions play out on that one and exactly when this one gets off the ground before we can really... But it's, it's, it's exciting that we could have that record as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's close. It is. It is. We'll get there eventually. Yeah. We've got a but bunch there was of... Another uh... big, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, but I'm sure we've got a lot of exciting questions about this. <laughs> we do have a lot of exciting <laughs> questions about this. Uh, David Dean uh, did $5 and asked, what zero-G recreational activities will the Inspiration4 crew enjoy during their mission other than taking shifts in the cupola? I think that's a we'll have to wait and see what they have planned. Um, but I, man, I, if I was on that flight, you'd have a hard time dragging me out of that cupola. <laughs> <laughs> it will be I just touching so myself to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, if I remember um, the, the whole teaser they're right now doing with Netflix and how they all build this up, I'm pretty sure they have some stuff planned for in-orbit activities. There will oh, yeah. be cool things. Because I think the final episode of the Netflix documentary is like, we get to see like their mission. We get to see the internal cameras. We get to see how they cut it all together. Oh, that'd be everything. great. Yeah. Which we'll is going to be that. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question from Musical Wolves. How often will Tour Dragon be launched? Do you have any idea? How, how long? How many? Say that again? Sorry. How often will Tour Dragon be launched? Oh, 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 Tor oh. Dragon. I, 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 get, I get what you're saying. Um, dragons that are sort of configured for, for tourism or, sub, uh, or orbital tourism instead of yep. flights to the International Space Station. Um, as long as there's someone to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the interesting thing that this showed, and I think this is more the heart of the question, um, we, th so, so there is no differentiation between a crew dragon that docks to the International Space Station and one that does a mission like Inspiration4. Um, SpaceX has has kind of shown that they they had thought that through and that you can simply pop the docking mechanism out when it's not a station mission and pop the cupola in instead and then take the cupola out, put the docking uh, mechanism back in, and you can sort of reconfigure them in that way so they can either be free-flying orbital missions like Inspiration4 or docking missions like like this. But the particular capsule they're using is Resilience, which flew the Crew-1 mission to the International Space Station. So it, it's it's not a tour dragon um, in that sense. But in terms of like these free-flying orbital flights that don't go to the space station that could be you know bought by private citizens, as long as someone's willing to buy the ticket, they'll do it. <laughs> but I love the name Tour Dragon configuration when it has the cupola. Like I do, I, I do like that Tour Dragon. Yes, <laughs> good idea right there. Um, did this for Inspiration Four? Did the mission reach its two hundred million goal yet? Do we know? Uh, the last I saw, it had not. But they were, but they were, they were continuing to increase. But the last I saw, it had not. No. Um, it is at i'm opening the the fundraiser yeah. right now <laughs> yeah i'm trying to find it, it as well uh according to the website it's at, at 29 mil a million oh plus the 100 million donated by uh uh isaac man so it's at 129 million dollars okay let's get there so the mission itself it will do a lot so hopefully it will hopefully it really will yeah, yeah um and, and there it MW... is that's resilience uh in the in the hangar they're getting ready for ir4 getting ready to roll out also a falcon knight heavy center core <laughs> <laughs> yes my pretties <laughs> see uh is spacex planning on using the new crew dragon cupola on other missions than inspiration for i know we sort of briefly touched on that with the previous question but uh do we have anything else confirmed for it Nothing else that has been released. No. Okay. Nope. We assume that probably eventually. 
Oh, m most definitely. The the other missions that aren't NASA crew rotation flights that the Dragons have scheduled are the Axiom flights, which are going to the International Space Station. So they will have the docking adapters instead of the cupolas. And the cupola is the big giant window. That's that's what a cupola is. Yeah. I'm not sure why I had to do that, but you got it. Like, <laughs> is that is that are we required to do that every time when we talk about it? Every time yep. we mention it, we have to do this. Now we are. Yes. No. No. <laughs> Cupola. <laughs> That's kind of no. Uh, is the cupola bigger than the new Shepherd windows? Uh, the cupola uh, is the largest glass structure that has been flown in orbit, uh, I believe I heard them say. So, yeah. yes. Yes. Because it's a single well, I, piece. No, I didn't There's consider no that. seam yeah. to that. Like, it's a single piece. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Herbs asks, how long can a free-flying dragon stay in orbit for? About six, five to six days is how long a free-flying dragon can stay in orbit. Uh, this mission is scheduled to last less than that, but could stay up a maximum of five. That's interesting, by the way, about the whole mission planning with this, because when you go up, you also have to consider where you go down and when. Since it's so close to each other, uh, you basically, as soon as you go up, you have to at least have an idea that there will be a window to splash down at some point in three-ish days. Right, which which is which is really good in in terms of like the ground tracks and going into a fifty-one degree inclination. Because this is this is the other thing about this mission: it's not going to the International Space Station, but it is launching into the ISS's inclination of fifty-one point six degrees. Um, largely, that's because of the downrange abort and recovery needs for the vehicle, um, where you have to have your uh, you have to have your recovery forces in place, right, to meet your, you know, Dragon can free float in the ocean for 24 hours if absolutely necessary before recovery crews get you. Um, and, and really, instead of redeploying all of those assets, just reutilizing what's already in place for the crew flights and going up the eastern seaboard of the U.S. and out across the northern Atlantic toward Ireland is what they're going to do, but they're going to go much, much higher than the ISS. They're going to go to 596 kilometers instead of the 420 that the ISS is at. So they're going to be up even higher than the Hubble Space Telescope is right now on their mission. And that, the views are going to be incredible from up there. I can't wait yeah. to see pictures. I think it's going to be fantastic. Oh, and there yeah. will be so many, I'm sure. Oh. Yes. Speaking <laughs> of really fantastic pictures, I do want to move us along a little bit because we have a whole bunch to talk oh, about. Yeah. The yeah. James Webb Space Telescope has a launch date for the end of the year. Adrian, do you want to get us started on that one? Yeah, it's launching basically before Christmas at December 18. And uh, of course, we'll launch on Ariane 5, the uh, about $10 billion uh, dollars expensive project at this point, if I recall correctly and uh, then do its whole deployment phase uh, right over Christmas. So if you ever <laughs> thought Christmas was stressful before, um, you're about to experience a whole nother level of stress during Christmas. And, Enjoy. And, and, le and let's ratchet up that stress a bit, because because as stressful as the launch is going to be, and we're going to come back to the launch date in a minute. Yeah, yeah. L scroll up there for me, Matt, and show me show that footage, show the show that image, because that is James Webb in its folded up like I'm ready to go to space configuration. <laughs> That's so cute. It, <laughs> it now needs to go. Ha! <laughs> once it gets in orbit. <laughs> Um, but 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 he, here's why Adrian said like as if the holidays aren't stressful enough because it's not just the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope that's going to be nerve wracking for so many people on on the 18th of December. After it gets to space, the deployments of the flight hardware involve 178 non-explosive release devices, more than 40 major single point failure deployments of 30 different types involving 155 motors and more than 600 pulley assemblies and nearly 100 cables totaling nearly uh, totally near to totaling nearly one quarter or 0.6 of a kilometer in length Jeez. so in stress yeah. terms we have like <laughs> all right dinner with the family here we have die hard here and then the james webb telescope is just somewhere up here in terms of really stressful events 
And there might yep. be added stress because I'm sure there are going to be fights between some family members saying, watch Die Hard, and someone on their phone going, <laughs> it's deploying panel five. <laughs> I'm looking forward to sit at the dinner table and arguing why it's important that I watch this stream right now. I, yeah. John can wait. We have it on video. <laughs> Um, but 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 let's let's talk a little bit about the launch since that's where we are in the animation right right now of, of this graphic because December eighteenth right like that that's just that's just a day on the calendar but but it means a lot right Adrian because like th this this telescope has been in development for twenty five years and it yeah. finally has a launch date like it so it's... much time has gone into this it, it, it I mean ah. Uh, December 18th, been, yes. Just <laughs> come on December 18th. <laughs> With these long-running missions, I always think about the people that work on this. And then I imagine that there are people who spent their whole uh, career so far, probably, working on just this telescope. And if you yeah. think about that, and if you really let that sink for a minute, then you realize we are stressed, but they are more stressed probably like oh yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> the stress we feel is more the stress for them on on yeah. that day of wanting it all to go perfectly and oh yeah but but i think quite quite critically there's one more Ariane 5 to go before James Webb. Uh, it's a it's a satellite launch on the 15th of October so coming up here in about a month uh, and, and, and a spacing of two months is about what the Ariane fives can do um, with their launch pad. It takes about two months to get another Ariane five ready. But what you just saw there, payload fairing separation is going to be the first time in that launch that a lot of people breathe. Because the Ariane five had about a year long launch drought, which at first, because they didn't say anything, a lot of us were thinking it was because of the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, satellites not being ready. And then all of a sudden it became known that no, 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 no. On the last two Ariane 5 flights, there were some rather significant issues with payload fairing separation where the fairing did not separate properly, but the mission still happened perfectly and, and without a hitch, but the fairing didn't come off the way it was supposed to. And while it wasn't an issue for those other satellites, it is a, an issue for James Webb because James Webb is huge. It barely fits within the payload fairing of the Ariane 5 to begin with. And the Ariane 5 was largely chosen because of its super large payload fairing for this um, particular for this particular vehicle. Um, but yeah, the Ariane 5 successfully returned to flight in August with the payload fairing separating as normal. But this second one on October 15th is the second and final test of the new payload fairing separation sequence. So that's going to be the first time a lot of people breathe easy. And then I think the other time people are going to breathe easy is when they confirm that Ariane 5 hasn't wandered off into the wrong orbit like it did a couple of years ago. Um, Remarkable save by the mission teams on that one um, when they realized it was just in the wrong orbit and the satellites could get themselves back down um, to to the um, to the inclinations that they needed to be. But like I think those are the two biggest launch day hurdles on the 18th where people will definitely feel a sense of relief if those two things happen successfully. Um, and anything else, before we talk about like, yeah, but like, what what questions do people have? Like, because I'm uh, sure this is uh, this is another one where they've got a lot. <laughs> so this is a very important question. Uh, Rakwa asks, can Chris G calculate the total number of individual failure points in the entire um, thing? In the entire thing, yes. Um, there are. Oh, oh, hang on. I can. I can. I can. I wrote this down earlier. Hang on. <laughs> you had know. this prepared. Uh, I think it's 300. I think there are 344 potential failure points, but only 178 of them are mission critical. I wasn't expecting you to have an answer to that. Oh, of course I have I'm an answer surprised for that. as well. <laughs> so impressed. <laughs> Just immediately. Yeah. Uh, all right. So does the James Webb Space Telescope unfold after reaching its final orbit? It unfolds both before and after reaching it. So um, it will begin the various un, un, uh, deployment sequences very shortly after liftoff, um, getting a solar array sticking out like you can see here for like a wave to the sun for high I want power and, and juice. And then it will start to deploy other uh, parts of its communication equipment and everything like that as it's on its way out to the L2, the Lagrange Point 2 
location, which is beyond the, which is just beyond the orbit of the moon. Basically, if you were to put the Earth, Sun, and Moon in a direct line with one another, James, it would go Sun, Earth, Moon, James Webb. Um, about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth is where it will reside for its primary mission. And we you can kinda... see all of it unfolding there <laughs> as we, uh, and I think that would be the 21st of December based on that right now. So you can see when we say like the holidays are going to be stressful, like it will be on deploying on Christmas day and on, you know, and, and throughout Hanukkah and throughout all the other, you know, hundreds of holidays that are celebrated throughout that time of year, it will be doing all of this at this point. Yeah, I think we, we talked about this uh, before the show. There is some really critical points around really like peak holidays time when it's mm -hmm. like 25, 26. That's when some really mission critical deployment happens. So you will be stressed out. <laughs> yeah, day six gonna be on the best. this animation is Christmas Day, December 25th. Yeah, for, for context. Yeah. <laughs> going to be the yeah. best Festivus ever. It will be the uh, Harry, best Festivus ever. <laughs> Harry Young has a really great question here. Uh, given Arian 5 was selected as the launch vehicle per the ESA contribution, is it actually also more efficient launching from Kuru to L2 than to the other launch sites? It is. It, it, that is another element of this. The closer you can get to the equator to nullify out your inclination difference, um, to the L2 point does help with the fuel consumption of the vehicle and what the rocket has to do. Um, so that 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 is also being near the equator is also a big help for JWST. Yeah. But as the work. question mentions, it's ESA's primary contribution um, in terms of the financial consideration to the telescope. Uh, James Webb is a is a joint effort between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. And, and sometimes the way you do that is some agencies will pay for the equipment, some agencies will pay for it to be built, and another agency will say, we'll give you the multi-million dollar launch vehicle as part of our contribution. And that's part of ESA's contribution to the mission is the Ariane 5. Brent Picasso asks, what's your take on the reliability of Ariane 5? Because I don't know that I'm feeling super happy about it after your talk earlier. <laughs> um, so uh, despite the talk earlier, Adrian, would you agree with me when I say we probably have built this into something scarier than it is? Ariane 5 is a very reliable launch vehicle. Um, it, it, it has, to, yeah, go ahead. To be fair, the, the fairing issues, for example, um, they had issues, but the mission still worked. Like, they... They, there are ways to fix problems, and uh, while um, it's not great to have fairing issues months before, years before such a critical mission, it also shows something good about this, that they were able to solve these problems. I think the, the backup deployment, something were great, um, some, something about that, but um, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm still confident that Ariane five will pull this off and i i doubt they would launch on it if if there was any doubt and by the way there's a really annoying fly flying around me sorry <laughs> <laughs> um and, and and i think to hammer home what you were just saying adrian from a mathematics and 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 um and and numbers standpoint uh to date the ariane 5 in its various configurations has launched 110 times and 108 of those flights have resulted in customer declared success um, with two outright failures. That's that a good, so good that's track record. Very good. Yeah, very, yeah. very good. Uh, it it basically right. means it's kind of tied with the Falcon 9 in that regard, based on where they are in, in their total number of launches and total number of outright failures. So I know we want to leave a, a good bit of chunk of time at the end for Starship. We've got um, mm -hmm. a few smattering of, uh, of random Super Chats I want to try to get through real quick. Um, Leave tracks. Thank you very much for becoming a new member and supporting the uh, the channel. Thank you so much. We couldn't do NASA Live without you guys. Uh, Music Wolf says JWT is complex and high risk. Uh, Tarek, <laughs> bring out Tarek. the graphic. He's always got the jokes. Uh, will Inspiration Four be able to see the Starlink satellite as they deploy, and or the ISS? Take us back to the Inspiration Four mission, real quick. Ooh, ISS, if they were able to see it, if, if they were like in the proper alignment for that would be a bright speck 
um, a bright star uh, every now and then, maybe a flare of the solar arrays, but no, like you're not going to be able to like see see them like you're like 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 the question is asking. No, got it. Uh, Dorkmo says, when will they allow cat companions on tourism flights? Very important. Ah, uh, very important. If I had my white cat, Mr. Bigglesworth, I, w- I, w- I would do that right now. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Animals on flights will have to see, like, like not non-scientific animals on flights. We'll have to see when that becomes a reality. You ever been a cat in space? We- oh, has there been a cat? I don't know if there's been a cat. There's been dogs, mice. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I can try to find that real quick. Ask another question. Yeah, I'll was. find that. Yeah, there was it, there was a cat. It, yes, Felicity, 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 what? Felicity. Aww. Yeah. Uh, and then 1963. I, I couldn't find a good section for this one, and Richard has been waiting very patiently for the last uh, 24 minutes, but he did five pounds uh, and said, uh, "Wasn't Apollo 17 timed as night launch and Apollo 11 timed to land during peak viewing?" Oh, that was our discussion earlier about if anybody else besides um. Inspiration has had. Yeah, for uh, great times. question. Yeah, great questions. Um, the so Apollo Eleven was timed based on the lighting conditions at its landing site, which meant there was one launch day, one day a month. So no, it had nothing to do with public viewing times uh, for Apollo Eleven. Uh, tw- most of the Apollo lunar landings t- launch windows were were based on where they were going and the. The, the sun angles at that particular one, but but Apollo 17 did have a rather long launch window um, on that day because they actually got down to T minus 13 seconds or something like that and, and aborted and recycled that day after a prolonged hold and launch. But no, the, the lunar launch windows were more where they were going on the surface than peak viewing times during the day. Uh, Apollo 11, I think, really just coincided with the, the middle of the day for when they needed to get off the ground. Okay. All right, going back to our list of topics, I don't know that we're going to get a chance to fully go through all the international stuff, but I do want to briefly touch on something real quick. Russia launched the Razbeg Reconnaissance Satellite on Soyuz. Um, China launched three satellites, I believe. Two? Two? Two, Two missions, Two. at least. Yes. Okay. All right. And then we also had uh, uh, tallies for launches worldwide right now. So, so far this year, 88 uh, rockets have successfully launched or does that include uh 88 orbital orbital launch, launch attempts orbital yep, launch just... attempts okay so 88 attempts u.s had 35 china had 33 russia 14 three out of europe two out of india and one out of iran indeed so that's, that's uh, where we stand right now good year so far there you go we're winning yeah. in this in the sports um starship everybody likes starship Oh, yeah, everyone does like Starship. It did some things this week, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, um, after a short like, vacation of Booster 4 in the high bay, where more more parts were installed, more, more things were done to it, uh, it came back to the launch site and uh, found a new home, a new place at the orbital launch table or the orbital launch pad, and is now sitting on there again. And it's insanely good to see uh, that booster coming back to the launch site, I think, and getting maybe, maybe we don't know, maybe <laughs> ready for testing in the future. I mean, there's still work we at hope. the... Yeah, yeah, we hope. I really want Boca <laughs> testing. Um, and yeah, it looks like uh, maybe when the GSE farm is ready to support a test, we might see booster testing also on the... If, if, if I just continue here, also on the Starship side, on the Ship 20 side, we saw a lot of Raptors arrive. I think we oh. are right now at three uh, sea level Raptors installed on Ship 20, and we saw a Vacuum Raptor arrive just yesterday. So we should be at around, uh, like, at four out of six engines on Ship 20 right now. Incredible. And just, I mean, I, re- I remember when this was being lifted and, and this was being done this week. I, I mean, 29 Raptor engines were just amazing to Beautiful. see again, especially since, like, these are ones that could potentially be fired in tests, you know, and a lot of them are probably the ones that are going to push, try to push this thing uphill uh, later this year. Just, oh, incredible to see all of those down there. And I don't know about you, Adrian, but I, I, I still look at that and like, I know they can because they've said they're going to, 
I still don't know how they're going to get four more in there. <laughs> nope. I, yeah. It's like, uh, I, I, I don't see space. Um, if, if, if I look at this, I'm like, how, how would you fit more engines there? There is, there is no space. They, did, did you, did you see, oh, uh, the, the, uh, the tweet <laughs> by Chris where he, we tweet, uh, where he showed, uh, uh, the, the other Chris, uh, where he yeah, showed, yeah. uh, the, the, um, the, the booster going down the street and the, the Raptors were like a little bit wiggly. Oh, um, and, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it is funny like that because when, cause when, the, when, the, when the steering systems aren't pressurized, you know, you, you do kind of get to see sometimes like how they wiggle and how they can move uh, when, when there are no like hydraulics holding them rock solid in place uh, and yeah. everything when they're just down in their null positions. Yeah. But it's funny to see uh, like these, these engines just uh, wiggling a bit. But yeah, yeah. Um, they're really... It, it looks like we have a, another search ahead with more GSC tanks arriving and more more ship parts for the next ships arriving. That's true, because because I was going to say like it, it's booster four. Like if you don't mind, Adrian, like I think I'll just go through really quick like what were some of the other main highlights of the week, and then I know these are the sections that we normally have the most number of questions for. So maybe we can just take questions from Absolutely. everyone yeah but because we also had work that was continuing on the new wider bay that's that's under initial construction and activities there at boca chica and starbase for the increase in production uh we also had more work on the orbital launch tower the quick disconnects and the and the catch arms that we saw the fueling systems are are coming along gse tank 7 was actually sleeved with a cryo shell uh this week as well uh, you, you touched on the vacuum raptors that have been found uh, that have been spotted at the launch site now too. Uh, the heat shield tile work is continuing on ship 20, which has been fascinating to see and bringing back wonderful, wonderful memories of other tiled vehicles. But it's it's been it's been a week of like what I would sort of say is very steady progress that that I think we'd really be looking for in terms of the systems getting ready for their next round of testing because there's still a lot of hurdles to get to the orbital launch flight and i know a lot of people have questions about that um but but i think this was a really good week of progress even if there weren't massively visual things aside from the booster getting rolled out and lifted yeah i feel like it's good to see finally see um vehicles move again and not gse tanks i i, I love gse <laughs> and it's a yes. cool topic to talk about but a booster is something else, and uh, I, I'm glad the thing that rolled down Highway 4 uh, was a booster, not a GSE tech. Right, the thing with the power, the thing with the power, right? Yeah. <laughs> the thing that moves. Yes. <laughs> but but yeah, what questions do we have? I'm, I'm sure there are so many about Starship this week. <laughs> yep, I'm your Huckleberry. All right, Mr. Pink has come <laughs> off the reservoir to say, what is the status of the orbital tank farm? Uh, yeah, so GSC Tank 7 was sleeved earlier this week. We've seen uh, quite a bit of work that's continuing to go on with some of the outfitting as well as um, the other tanks that are sort of still being built out by the production site as well. Um, but, but Adrian, where, where, where are we with the, uh, in a bit more detail there with the, with the propellant farm? Um, I, know, I know that is sort of one of the long lead items that they, that they still have, although basically everything is a long lead item right now at Starbase. <laughs> if, I, if I recall correctly, there's only one GSE tank missing. That is yeah. right now in the mid bay and is being constructed there. And I'm not, I think three more shells, two or three. I'm, I'm, Chad will probably correct me on that in a, in a few seconds. Three more shells, okay, there we go. Three more shells uh, needed. And as soon as that is in place, we have at least uh, the heavy hardware in place. Of course, after that still comes installation, making sure everything works, checking the piping. You want to check and to test GSE, and they will probably do that and do all these installation and fitting process. And 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 in in. And that also includes, too, at the GSE and the fuel farm tanks, the uh, pumping of the, the nitrogen into the, the, the space between the cryo shells and the tanks for that insulation and everything that they're using there to maintain the cryogenic conditions in 
those tanks because when even though they're made from the same material as Starship, right, they need that insulation because they're being asked to hold the liquid methane and the liquid oxygen and keep it cryogenic for long, 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 long periods of time. So, so that's another main thing. And you can see the propellant farm here actually um, at, at work on the propellant production plant. There we go. Uh, you, you can see that uh, continuing there at Starbase as, as well. It's, it's a nice little like self-sufficient area that they're trying to build there for, for a lot of what they need. We had yeah, a related question. Sense. Oh, uh, go ahead. Just, just a small point, but it, does make sense if you want to support a lot of launches there you will need a lot of locks and you need a lot of uh, other gases as well so if you can uh, if you can produce them at Boca, it makes sense to do it there because it's not exactly easy to get things to Boca all the time no. i i heard <laughs> no bit right. we had a related question from carl who asked can they test the booster with a partially completed gsc farm um, I, I think I think they might be able to, and 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 let me break that down um, because you you don't need for for some of these tests, right? You don't need to put the full fuel load on board, right? For 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 a quick static fire of your engines, you would only technically need the amount of propellant that would be burned in those few seconds that the engines are firing, plus a little bit of reserve, right? And we've definitely seen, Adrian, right, that on the ship round of tests and even the flight tests that we've seen with the ships so far, there definitely has not been a full fuel load, mainly because if they put a fuel, full fuel load in the ships, the Raptors would not have had enough thrust to lift the thing off the ground. Um, yeah. But but yeah, so so because they don't need a full propellant load to do some of these tests, I, I would answer that question as yes. Like if you could get a couple locks and a couple methane tanks up and running with the cross country lines going to the pad, if you can get those up and running to start testing, you could start doing some cryogenic testing of your vehicle, both from the liquid oxygen and methane side if you wanted to go that way, but you could also do cryogenic testing with cryogenic nitrogen if you could get that part of the fuel farm up and running. Again, because it, when you do cryogenic testing, you kind of want to do it with nitrogen first because nitrogen is inert. So if something goes wrong, you don't have an explosion risk before you start loading the cryogenics that are volatile under the right con set of conditions with each other. As we, yeah. as we saw in uh, some circumstances before in Boca Chica. Yes, yes, my minor ruds, right? <laughs> yeah, little, minor. little, small explosions. Yes. <laughs> uh, we had uh, five dollars come in from Michael East. Thank you so much for the uh, the support there. No, no message associated with it, but we appreciate it. Uh, Musical Wolves also did five dollars and asked, "What is the difference between canceled and revoked closures?" I, I, I really only think that there is some person updating the Cameron County website and sometimes he uh, or she uses different words to do it. <laughs> okay. And I, I, I know some of the people who create bots to track this are sometimes really annoyed by the wording changing because it makes uh, the bots uh, misbehave. So, yeah. I, I, I concur with that. I, th I think it's just either one person or two different people who are just using different words to mean the same thing. We had uh, $10 come in asking, how bad is it, and, and if you could explain this fully, uh, how bad is it to SF a RVAC on the ground under ship 20? Could you deconstruct that to for stat me? Okay, how, oh yes, I can. How bad is it to static fire a vacuum Raptor engine on the ground under ship 20? Very easy. Vacuum engines, there, there is, a, and I understand this question perfectly because we talk about vacuum engines, and and so you would automatically think, oh, well, they operate in vacuum because that's when they light. With that's when we light them. Really, all the vacuum indicator means next to an engine is just that it has been optimized to function in a vacuum in terms of the thrust and the specific impulse that it's able to give you. But but vacuum optimized engines can be ignited on the ground, absolutely no problem. Okay. Uh, Stefan asks, uh, is Starship super heavy currently FAA approved? <laughs> uh, well, oh, wow. How to answer that power? question. I, uh, uh, to the spirit it's of your big question, talking point. negative, it is not. Um, <laughs> but, but in a way it is. So, so this is weird, right? Like, like the FAA is well aware of what SpaceX is doing. They're, they're well aware and they're, they're following along in the process. So like, 
if the FAA had a major issue with it, would, would you know, odds are something would be known by this point. Have they granted approval for the orbital flight? They absolutely have not. Um, so being approved by the FDA as something that can fly by the FDA, let's try that again, by the FAA is, um, is, is, is like you are an approved vehicle that can fly, right? Starship is sort of an approved vehicle that can fly, but it still needs licenses for each one of its individual flights or a batch granting of a launch license to ships X through X, right? Um, so like earlier we saw Starship 11 through, um, or like 15 through 17 got a batch launch license where the FAA said they are similar enough in their construction that we will grant the license to launch them together. But the FAA still then has to approve on the day, yes, you're ready to go. Um, so there's a few different layers of FAA approval when you're dealing with a test flight program versus an operational system. Uh, Adrian, anything anything you'd want to add to that on the FAA side? Not really. I mean, we know they're waiting. They're still waiting for approval. And uh, yeah, that's the one of the many things that need to clear before they can orbital launch. OK, uh, let's see. Can $10 here from uh, Alfiado, who asked, can SpaceX uh test booster four on pad a i would say it depends um they can probably test some of the engines there however the the suborbital test stands will not support a static fire of many raptor engines it basically would melt they there's a reason why they are right now constructing this orbital pad, which can sustain the, the power of 29 Raptors firing above it. Uh, the small test stands maybe can three, maybe even more, but they won't be able to uh, support 29 Raptor engines. That is not possible on the smaller pads. And it's probably more advantageous to them to do the testing with Booster 4 at the orbital pad because that allows you to shake out all the ground support equipment and fueling equipment that is very different from the suborbital pad locations because we, we've we never actually been able to get confirmation if there is cross-feed between the suborbital fuel farm and the orbital fuel farm, but we don't think there is. So, um, so get, getting that opportunity to shake out and really check out the orbital launch side of all the systems that are out there, it, it would be the bigger use of putting Booster 4 on the orbital pad, I would say. Let's see, we've got a whole bunch here. So we're just gonna, I'm sure that we'll have questions through the very end. Uh, Jack Mask asked, um, at Nest Space Flight, did you notice RB4 next to RB20? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think everyone did. <laughs> And everyone was expecting it anyway, so... Oh, of course, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, nobody was surprised. It was like, yeah, Elon. I honestly you know would have been disappointed Elon. if they weren't next to each other. <laughs> I imagine the rage if there was one engine in between. Like, it was 4, 6, 20. The internet <laughs> would probably add Elon one million times. <laughs> um, we... Another, another super chat here. This one will probably take a little bit of time to go into. Any comments on the Amazon letter rant? Uh, talking about <laughs> the, the Bezos. Um, oh, man. That's a question I wasn't. Message. Man, Adrian, I don't know about you. I wasn't expecting that question, but I like it. No. Um, no. Yeah, so so let's, let's uh, let me first set the stage and then I'll, I'll, I want your opinion first, Please. Adrian, on, on this. Um, so, so for those of you who aren't aware, what, what this is referring to is there are there are basically about not on average about once a week there will be a complaint filed with the fcc from amazon and kuiper systems related to starlink and basically spacex's copy and paste response to all of these has just become Yet another week, yet another challenge from a company that seeks to delay a competitor while not actually building a system of their own. No, you. And, 
And a lot of these challenges from what I can dig into and what I can find so far, I'm not all the way through them, but, but a lot of these challenges don't go anywhere. Like, like they just slow processes down. And to be fair, this is a tactic that, that Amazon and other Jeff Bezos companies use, right? They, they use the legal system to their advantage to, in, in some ways, slow people down. That does not mean that what Amazon complains about and, and files protests for in these letters are all meaningless, right? They do have some that are, you know, raising questions and concerns, but I think overall, maybe Amazon should be a little bit careful because as they continue to develop their constellation and things change in the development and maybe they want to tweak the number of satellites in a particular orbit and maybe they want to tweak the orbital heights that the Kuiper constellation is at, they're doing a lot of laying the groundwork for companies to just come and go, well, now, wait a minute, you said you didn't like us doing that, so why are you allowed to do it? You know, like they're set, they're setting an unfortunate precedent with a lot of, this. but 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 basically the, the question is the question is is relating to this is is the, the just almost weekly filings by Amazon to attempt to do something and affect something with Starlink and basically SpaceX's answer has just become yet another week, yet another challenge, yet another non-launch week for Kuiper. Um, but Adrian, what, what do you think about this? <laughs> Yeah, first off, I, I totally agree with your point that this might become a really difficult to dodge boomerang for them in the future. Um, so, yeah, that that's one point of this. And also, as long as SpaceX is just doing these replies, like these really low effort, just, uh, yeah, whatever, I'm not really worried because if that is the answer of SpaceX, uh, they are probably not worried at all that these have any ground to stand on that could hurt them. Because if there would be any ground, they would for sure have a more serious way to re replying to it. And um, yeah, it, it, it's yeah. a delaying, it's an annoyance, but also it's something we saw from uh, Amazon and Amazon-like companies before. So. Yeah, and and I and I think another thing to your point about how like you know this, this clearly isn't delaying them. There's a Starlink launch in two days into a polar orbit. That's a that's a new shell because they completed the first one back in May with with the with the final launch of the version one satellites and the version one point fives are are going to start launching here on September thirteenth. I believe the launch time for that is eight fifty five p.m. Pacific time on Monday. So. Um, uh, but, but, but and you know, like some of the some of the things that Amazon has said in here is like, well, wait a minute. SpaceX said that like they're taking issue with SpaceX saying, well, if we can only launch them on the Falcon Nine, here's how we could deploy them. But if you allow us to launch them on Starship, here's how we would deploy them. Right. So basically, SpaceX is presenting, hey, it depends on which launch vehicle you approve us to launch them on. But here are the two options. And Amazon's argument is basically, oh, so we're just letting anyone do anything they want anymore and not have an actual plan. And SpaceX's response is, no, we do have a specific plan. It just depends on which launch vehicle we're given permission to launch the, them on, right? Because the Falcon 9s can only take 60 at a time. Starship could take hundreds at a time. You know, so it's just literally like that's sort of the bickering points that they're at with these letters right now. Yeah, a lot of lot of what Blue is uh, Blue Amazon, sorry, um, is saying uh, feels like yeah, I know, uh, feels like <laughs> like the usual um, f have lawyers to really find something that we can throw at them and see if something sticks. And, and, and we know. And we know from the human lunar landing system stories that have come out, right, some, from some really good investigative pieces that some other journalists have done that, you know, Blue Origins head people were like wringing their hands in happiness at getting to sue NASA to slow the human landing, lunar landing system down. So it's a tactic they're used to. Yeah. yeah. Going back to more technical topics, Skunk Works <laughs> came in. <laughs> with uh, 10 euro earlier and uh, just offers this clarification. Not all VAC engines can be fired on the ground. Flow separation and the bell will vibrate it apart. Our VAC doesn't have an expansion ratio high enough for this to matter. Other VACs do have this issue. Yes. So so admittedly, part of what I did not say in that answer is a lot of times when you see vacuum you? optimized engine, I know, right? Um, a lot of times when you see vacuum optimized engines fired on the ground, they don't have the engine bell with them um some some of them do because as you say the raptor vax the, the the flow separation isn't a problem but on vacuum optimized engines where that might be a problem sometimes they can just remove the nozzle like it they can be fired on the ground um 
based on their, yeah, based on what they need. But yeah, there are different ways to do it. But point taken, not all of them can be with their with their engine nozzles. Still, still a good uh, clarification, and thank you, Skunkworks, for that support. Yes. Um, we have here uh, a question from Maxipa, who asked, "Are those rectangular things above the Raptor boost engines? Or, I'm sorry, what are those rectangular things above the bo boost engines on B4? Uh, possibly mounting points for the booster TPS? Do we have a picture of that? I... Yeah. Do we have a, the rectangular things above the engines? Uh, so I'm... the booster will not have tiles. So we can answer that 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 last part um, uh, concretely. They're 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 not mounting points for tiles because the boosters won't have them." Um, oh, rectangular things, the black rectangular things, those are the COPVs. Um, those are the composite over at pressure vessels, which provide helium, oh. um, uh, which provide helium no. pressurization to both uh, start the engines and for pressurization of the tanks. Um, those big black rectangular things above the engines are the COPVs, yeah. Or are these really small ones, men, that are right above every engine? There's, but that... Why do those they could be attachment for something, right? Like right above every engine, there's this. Oh, oh, I I noticed that. I'm I'm not sure if that's a ground yeah. carrier plate, like like where they would potentially grab the engines as they're being mounted. Are they particular data lines that might connect down into the bait? You know where where the where the launch table is. Is there something that connects to them to pull? data or information. I, I'm not actually sure what those specific things are, but, um, but, but on the off chance you were talking about the larger black rectangles, they're the COPVs. <laughs> a, a, a voice in my head tells me that the hold down arms hold the booster down on those. Oh, so sorry. I, I didn't mean hold down arms. I, I, I meant like, um, so they're, ah, there are different types of T0 umbilicals. Um, there are hold down arms and hold down clamps that literally like grab the vehicle and hold it on. And then there are others that just sort of connect up to the side of it and they don't bear any weight. They don't do anything, but they can be data and electrical transmission um, things uh, and, and, and conduits in there. But, um, but yes, obviously that's not the hold down system. Yeah. Uh, it, so we have, I think, time for, for one last question here from Zahas, who notices that Elon doesn't seem to stress about the FAA a lot. What's up with that? That's, Elon that's being an Elon. Interesting, <laughs> yeah, I feel like as soon as that happens, we know SpaceX is, is, is getting ready for the orbital launch. As long as that doesn't happen, maybe SpaceX has some other work to do still before they are orbital ready. And that's why he's not yet on Twitter um, pushing the FAA as far as he can and as he wants. There might also be a, a, another factor to that. I agree with you totally, Adrian. I agree with you totally on that. Um, there, the other factor that might be in play here is that as of right now, it's not actually up to the FAA to approve the flight or not because the environmental assessment impact is not done. For the orbital launch site yet and that still requires a 30-day comment period and then a 30-day review of the comments after that so we're we, we are still realistically just from the environmental impact assessment 60 days at minimum if it came out tomorrow um away from the faa being able to to approve it from from all the different regulatory standpoints that um that sort of factor into this so that might also be another reason why we haven't really seen a stress out about the faa just yet is because they're, they're not the hurdle right now to, to getting this ready yeah. to fly. I mean, we are maybe we are lining up for a double Christmas nervous package between <laughs> uh, James Webb Space Telescope and uh, Starship 20 going trying to go to orbit. So maybe I'll, we are I'll, in for a double header. I'll tell you this, I won't be nervous about Starship trying to get to orbit for a couple of different reasons. One, it's the first attempt. So everyone is automatically forgiving on the first attempt because it's incredibly hard to do it if you don't have heritage. In fact, um, we, uh, we, a bunch of people figured that it went, went through the, the list and tried to figure this out. And the only vehicles that we can find in history, there are only three that did not have significant heritage to a previous vehicle that made it to orbit on their first attempt were the Ariane 1, the Proton, and the Space Shuttle. All the others did not, or had significant heritage overlap from previous vehicles and succeeded on their first attempt. So we'll see. 
Because I don't, I, I really wouldn't give, aside from maybe the landing software, I really wouldn't say that Starship has a heritage to Falcon 9 in that regard. Um, so I'm not really nervous about Starship. It will do what it'll do, and if it doesn't make it on its first attempt, it'll make it shortly thereafter. Um, I'll, I'll see, focus, I'll save all my nervous awesome. energy to, for James Webb. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I am nervous about uh, for the first star Starship attempt? I yeah. hope they at least clear the tower. Uh, I think the oh, worst scenario yeah. would be if they blow up the whole orbital launch site. I th I think they cleared the tower. If if, if <laughs> I were if I were going to predict it, I I think they'd clear the tower. And and if they had an issue during first stage, maybe you're out. Of, ho hopefully, you've cleared Boca Chica at that point, and you're and you're out over the Gulf at that point. But I yeah. I think just based on the Raptor reliability that we've seen so far, the odds are pretty good that they at least clear Boca with it. Yeah, I have to say. Of course, for never me, say never. It's <laughs> yeah, for me, it's Miko. Like uh, until Miko, I'm I'm like I hope they reach it, and after Miko, that's all bonus. Um, well, if that's... it hits Miko, it's it's worked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's headed for Hawaii at that point. If it hits Miko, um, <laughs> yeah, um, and 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 Miko means main engine cutoff. Um, yeah. the, the end of ascent. Yes, the end of ascent. Like if he gets like second stage ignition, we have sip separation, we have a booster making a splashdown, and the ship at least getting close to the direction where it wanted to go. That alone, that that's okay. I, actually, I, actually, I, I I fully agree with you, Matt. I'm interested in your in your take on this too. Like that 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 that's a great point. I I think personally, I I'd count it as a success if they can get through stage separation successfully and ignite the engines on ship and get going like if the, if that weird we're just gonna flip it like a deck of cards <laughs> like we do starlink works for separating those stages okay. i'll be honest my my bar is real low like as soon as they light it up to begin with i'm like success I, I'm, I'm pleased so i i do hope True. that it doesn't come apart on the tower we want everything to stay intact uh, I am I am morbidly curious about how well that thing can stand up to that kind of blast. Um, yeah, <laughs> sixteen million pounds of thrust leaving the launch pad it's, it's, is it's insane. Lot. It's double the Saturn V. I can't wait. <laughs> imagine imagine uh. the picture of Starship going up and the orbital launch tower slowly tipping over, and you're like, eh. like a cartoon. It's just gone. Poo! It's, yeah. it's it's like it's like smoke ghost is there like <laughs> didn't know that was like a support arm like they have with yeah. the fucking nines and it's going down now <laughs> <laughs> that's new well uh, it has happened again our viewers have wasted another perfectly good hour and a half listening to nerds <laughs> talk about rockets uh chris and adrian do you have anything else that's burning in you that you want to talk about before we end here uh, not really, except to all of you, I, when we get the launch time for Inspiration4, I hope you're watching and, and I really hope you follow along with that mission and, and for whatever you are personally capable of, if you can, um, for the research, for the pediatric cancer research at St. Jude's, if you can donate and you haven't already, I would highly encourage you to do that to support that mission. That is, that is really an incredible charity i i really would recommend that you you look into it if you if you don't know what they're doing over there it's some of the best charity work i could imagine um well i, I think we're gonna go ahead and end it then um adrian bile is a reporter with nasa space flight adrian where can people find you uh it's my twitter account at bc car counters which is the old thing i did in boca chica counting cars <laughs> and <Chris> okay <laughs> <laughs> Chris Gebhardt is uh, the assistant managing editor for for NASA Space Flight. I have so many questions about the previous thing. Um, Chris, I, I, do, I, I, I do too. I do too. Th uh, th <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, I can be found at Chris G underscore NSF on Twitter. Like Adrian, do they kick you out of the lot if they catch you counting cars? Like, is no, there like a casino too... bouncer? Should I should I do very short story time here? Yes, please. Very right, short. Right yes. before we end. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, the 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 story behind this is that previously we hadn't really known the the, the milestones. So the best way to guess if a pad would clear soon and if they would start testing soon was counting cars going to the pad and from the pad. So what I did was sitting there for hours when the road cl closure happened and counting cars of SpaceX employees going back and forth in the streams and trying to predict if the pad is clear or not. Love it. So that's the name origin. I love you so much. <laughs> uh, I and I have been your host, Matt Anderson. You can find me on Twitch and on Twitter at Bad News Baron. Um, just a reminder that we do have a merch store for NASA Space Flight. You can check out the merch store link and uh, get access to all manner of wonderful, wonderful garments you can wear on your torso that have a variety of memes that have developed over the last however long this has been this has been running get your your when hop gear there when orbit um and i think that uh with that we're gonna go ahead and end. just a reminder we do have the uh live stream that's going on 24 7 for uh for nasa space flight with an eye on starbase so go check that out i think we're gonna head over there next yeah indeed absolutely all right thank you everybody for watching and uh thank you for your constant support we appreciate it Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.